Sign up at MyBookie and use our promo code GATERS to get your first ever deposit match dollar for dollar. Bet anything, anywhere, anytime with MyBookie. Get the Manscaped Performance Package at Manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping when you use code GATERSBREAK20. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. Never a dull moment in Gator Nation, but man, sure are some frustrating and disappointing moments in Gator Nation, especially coming off of this 20 to 13 defeat at the hands of the Kentucky Wildcats. I'm your host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Ooh, this one hurts. Um, plenty to get into. Very disappointing performance. Lightluster performance. Heartless performance. Any, you can think of any way, many ways to describe this one. Starts at the top. We'll get into all that. Of course, this is a game review. We'll get into the game itself, too. I know there's plenty of big picture items to get into. I'll hit on that a little bit as well. Um, plenty of time <laughs> to discuss that this week, too. Uh, this will look at uh, – it kind of will blend the two uh, with this episode, with the game review, because that's honestly the nature of it right now, um, a big part of it. Where does Florida go from here? How did Florida get here? I mean, you can you can look at this many ways, uh, and we'll, we'll do that here, mainly looking at the game. We'll have some time this week as well to look at everything else um, when we go through this week or here on Gators Breakdown. But I, I get you. I feel you. You guys know uh, I'm a fan first. I don't hide that one. That was that was poor. That that one hurt. Uh, the, the 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 fan in you really really looks at this one in uh, in a hurtful, disappointing way. Let's get right into it. Uh, for, first, let me. Uh, I'll shout out Gators Breakdown Plus last night too. We did the post game show, uh, post game chat. It was cathartic. Um, a little bit of rehab. And discussing everything long up went on for an hour uh, uh there just discussing what went on there so uh i feel you i think we, we were all kind of down on it and uh that was uh last night was an adventure uh in for the first time we've had it like that on gators breakdown plus so uh, everybody who joined in after the game thank you very much there uh for everything we got into last night but hey look just right here get into it won't waste much more time plenty to get into I mean, this is, I'll start with a tweet that I put out, you know, kind of the main thought here with looking at everything and tying it to the game. 382 yards for Florida, 211 yards for Kentucky. You lose 20 to 13. You had that yard edge and you found a way to lose the game. Penalties added up to pretty much kill any advantage there. Uh, you know, stats don't tell the whole story a lot of times. You know, you can pick out stats and tell a story. Uh, this one, you can pick out a stat, tell the story of yards edge, penalties, way to shoot yourself in the foot, way to not be prepared. Offense didn't look ready to play in that environment. Conservative nature most of the game. Lack of explosive plays, lack of focus, lack of coaching. Uh, absolutely no reason to lose this game in this fashion. And it starts up top. I mean, look, many people were picking an upset. Many people were picking a close game. You don't lose in this fashion, not in year four under Dan Mullen, not going on the road for the, you know, this, this is nothing new. Yeah, 2020 was different in the road crowd and all that, and I, but no, that is no excuse here. No accountability. And, I mean, where is the accountability in not being ready for this game? Uh, you, you cannot go out there and put that performance. Uh, you know, where – and we'll start post game. You know, where is the accountability in saying you weren't out coached after you lose a game like this? This is what Dan Mullen had to say after the game. When he was asked about being outcoached, no, but 382 yards, I guess that's sputtering. I don't know. We had 382. They had 211 yards. I wouldn't think that would be the case. Talking about he didn't think that would be the case of him being outcoached. Um, I think the guys did some pretty good things right there, moving up and down. I think we got to really look at the penalties that we have and how to get ourselves better in a situation that way. I got to do a better job coaching up the PAT field goal group they're a physical group. We outrushed them. We outpassed. We out total gained them. Time of possession. We were better on third downs. You still lost. Kentucky made the plays. Florida didn't. Kentucky wasn't making the mistakes. Florida was. 
Kentucky 20, Florida 13, them on you were out coach. You were out prepared. You know, and coaching just not on game day either. I mean, you're coaching throughout the week, getting your team prepared. That's part of it as well. And in year four, you can't put that performance out there. I'm sorry. I mean, I'll give Kentucky credit. Is Kentucky a better program than what they have been? Absolutely. But after Dan Mullen's start in 2018 and 2019, you should have been able to build a bridge far enough away from Kentucky. Yeah, they're getting better, but why didn't you get better in the same regard in 2018, 2019 when you had a chance to build on it? You had a chance to build this program to where you don't lose games last night. You don't lose fluke games. You know, you, you, I know we, we've taught recruiting, all that. You, you, you should have been able to put yourself in a better position not to lose a game like that. I don't care how good Kentucky got or how good Kentucky is. You should have been able to get better in that same regard Look, there's been a lot of good things uh, under Dan Mullen, but program growth probably isn't one of them right now when you, when you look at it. And you have to factor in last night's game. You have to factor in that performance last night. And you, the gap should – if Kentucky's going to grow and develop as a program at the start you had in 2018 and 2019 and sh- shouldn't – needing to you, – you should have been able to build off of that. You should have been able to build the program in – I won't say the same way as Kentucky because, but I say grow the same way as Kentucky. Kentucky has put it together, grown, grown enough to now maybe even close the gap a little bit in far as when you combine talent and development, it should have been the same way. You should have been able to garner more recruits after a good 2018 and 2019 early in your career. That didn't necessarily happen. I mean, in ways it has transfer portal, all that stuff, but no, you know, not, not to the point to where you don't lose games like this. You know, you, you, a lot of teams can go out there when, when they have the talent, have bad performances, and still come out with a victory, you know, with teams that are better than. But that's not there right now. Better, to team, better team was prepared, got out coached. Florida not ready to play a road game on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, I'll, I'll quickly use the game here, go more into the game. Yes, the defense gave up the first, the, the first big touchdown. Florida was up 7 nothing. Yes, the defense gave up a big first touchdown, but this loss nowhere near on that side of the ball. Other touchdowns, one coming off a blocked field goal, and the other happening when Kentucky's in great field position after the Emory Jones interception. Bad, terrible read interception. Uh, some good things on that side of the ball for the defense, holding Kentucky to 224 yards, allowing only seven completed passes, uh, by Will Levis. Chris Rodriguez did some nice things, but only 99 yards and a, you know, a touchdown. But you know, two touchdowns given up from the defense you know, should have been more than enough for Dan Mullen, his offense, and it was not. You know, defense really only give up 13 points. Sorry, Dan Mullen, your offensive coach, your offense, you, that's enough for you to go win this game. Oh, so what do we get into here? Why did it happen? I think we look at the game here. Little sense of urgency. It just looked like we've we've hammered enough time as a as a fan base here on Gators Breakdown as well. That you know, sense of urgency, lack of killer instinct, um, playing down to the competition. However, you want to define it, but it just looked like, seemed like last night versus Kentucky. It was just wanting to do enough to get by that approach. Something that happens way too often under Dan Mullen. Uh, I think he was caught off guard a little bit by the performance up front from the offensive line in both ways. You know, getting out physical, getting beat, and, of course, the penalties racking up. Um, I think he was caught off guard with their play, their lack of focus. Uh, now, you know, I'll start with the play and the conservative thought here. You know, Florida's run the ball exceptionally well coming into this game so far, so I'm not blaming Mullen for wanting to rely uh, on the run game. For, for the offense, and if, if, if Florida couldn't run the ball, uh, I think we all knew this offense might be in a little bit of trouble, but you know, that's a slippery slope right now with the way the, the run game was performing coming into this game. Uh, so to say running the ball means being conservative when the run game's been working this year, I, I won't go that far, um, but it's mostly the conservative talk comes from not pressing the ball down the field, comes from running the ball in a lot of third and longs and not taking chances in the, in the passing game. Comes from not trying to drive the ball down the field before halftime. Wasting and holding, not wasting three timeouts, holding three timeouts 
And look, I know AR didn't look like the AR we saw the first couple games, uh, but maybe you can even stretch the conservative approach by limiting the most explosive player on your team by not giving the ball, not giving him even more chances. I know it didn't look as good, but he's still the most explosive player on your team that has been proven so far this year. Uh, and you couldn't push the ball downfield in the run game. You couldn't push the ball downfield in the passing game. And he's been able to, to, to bring you that so far this season. And when you could have used a big play, when you could have used a, a, an explosive play to pop something in a close game, I think you can look at maybe that being part of the conservative approach as well here for Dan Mullen. Not a good look. Certainly, certainly not a good look. Lack of focus, lack of detail. I think you can go in that with this game as well. All the procedure penalties up front on the offensive line. It was clear. Whatever they worked on during the week, the clapping in the stadium from the quarterback position, giving them issues. Yet little was done to correct the issue. Led the way eight false starts. Six of those on third or fourth down. Shot yourself in the foot plenty of times. Not prepared. Gators were penalized 15 times for a total of 115 yards. 15 times for 115 yards total. Nope, that will not get it done. Inexcusable. Most penalties Florida has received in a game since September 17, 2011, when they were flagged 16 times for 150 yards in a win over Tennessee. And look, this threw the whole offense off. What happened? I mean, what, what happened this week in practice? I think that's the best question we can ask. I heard it was a good week in practice uh, all week. Uh, maybe the physicality part of it. I mean, maybe that's where that comes from. But certainly not in getting ready for a road environment. And so, so what happened this week in practice? You know, simulating crowd noise is, uh, uh, helps, but, you know, a real game is different. But – what we saw from Florida versus Kentucky in that regard, they weren't ready at all for that. And it really affected the Florida offensive line. They were a tad behind once the penalties started to ramp up, uh, couldn't fire off the ball, could play nowhere near like we've seen them play so far this year. Um, for all the credit I've given the offensive line this season, rightfully so, inexcusable from offensive line coach John Hevesy and those guys. You can that, – that was, that was pitiful. Um, credit to Kentucky for, for creating that environment, creating havoc up front uh, to mess with this Florida offensive line. But at the, at the, at the same point, you, you have to settle down and focus. You have to settle down and focus as a staff, figure out what's going wrong, figure out what can happen uh, to, to help your team, what needs to happen to help your team. Go to a side like count if you need to. Uh, and if you even tried it too little too late, settle down and focus. And that's on the players too. Uh, and that's not just on coaching, but you know, it, ultimately that goes to the top. When it's, when it's that bad of an issue time and time again, that's on, that's on coaching first. It takes both to be that bad, but that's on coaching first. Lack of preparation, lack of adjustments in game. One more lack of detail. Once again, special teams. Florida leaves a lot to be desired on special teams anyway. We know that. And we've, that's been something we've discussed for, for years under Dan Mullen, at least a few last few weeks. Missed extra point versus Alabama comes back to haunt you. Blocked field goal return for a touchdown comes back to haunt you. There's no threat on special teams from Florida. There's no, nobody's scared of a punt return, man. Nobody's scared of a kickoff return, man. Nobody's scared for you to come after a punt. And now found ways in the kicking game to compound the issue. Missed extra points, blocked field goals, turns into a touchdown. Uh, so you know, once again, this season, you know, once again, this season, and this has been a systemic issue for a while, block field goal return for a touchdown versus Kentucky. I mean, that, <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to keep going with the maybe lack of detail, lack of focus. Damian Pierce played, was playing great. First half of the game R running more to me. That's another lack of, Lack of detail, lack of focus here. Four carries for 42 yards, 10 and a half yard average at halftime. He ends the game eight carries, 54 yards for the game. Your best running back, probably for, maybe for the season, but certainly versus Kentucky. Lack of, a, you know, to me, this is the lack of detail in, in, in adjustments. I know you want to rotate running backs, 
But at some point as a head coach, some point as a, the offensive staff, you've got to realize what you have. You've got to realize in a close, tight ball game, you need every play that you can get. And Damian Pierce was providing that. Four carries for 42 yards in the first half. Eight carries for the whole game. Only four carries in the second half. You know, if you needed every play you could get, Mullen couldn't adjust and go with the hot hand. Florida had 19 carries in the second half compared to 20 passing attempts. And Pierce only four of the carries after having a great first half on limited carries. So lack of detail, lack of focus. Many picked this game to be close. Many picked this game to be an upset. But in how this game played out, this team was not ready, not prepared. Once again, outcoached. All right, we'll get into some more specifics here in the game to kind of show you the lack of focus, lack of detail, <laughs> you know, the, the whole lack of coaching, lack of game management, all of it. It ties in together uh, here. You, know, you probably hear I'm disappointed here. You know, I was up till four o'clock, you know, <laughs> rewatching the game, taking notes, all that stuff. But, you know, plenty, plenty more detail to get into for this and why things went so bad versus Kentucky. But before we do, get on some betting action. Tom Betty, Tom Brady returns to New England for the first game, for the biggest game of the year, and the stakes has never been higher at my bookie. Look, I know, you know we're listening to this on Sunday. You still, it's a Sunday night game. You still got some time to get that, still got some time to get that bet in. But whether you're backing the Bucks or the Pats on this Sunday night, game's always more exciting when you've got some money on it. So go bet at my bookie. You get in on the action. Take this game to a whole new level at my bookie. Both teams are sporting top defenses. Nobody knows each other better than Brady and Belichick. So get some money in on it. I mean, if you don't want to, and if you can't make it to this game to bet on it, if you're listening to this episode a little bit late, you still got the West Coast battle Monday night as the Raiders and Chargers go at it. You can bet NFL, college football, baseball playoffs, MMA, boxing, all that right now at my bookie. So don't wait around. Join my bookie now and get in on the biggest bet of the game if you want to bet Bucks and Patriots or that Monday night game. Use promo code Gators and get your first deposit doubled. Again, that's promo code Gators to get your double your first deposit with my bookie and start your winning season today. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. And it is fall time, and our friends at Manscaped are here to make sure you keep things fresh this fall with the leaders in male grooming and their brand-new fourth-generation performance package. Join the 2 million men worldwide using Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with code GATORSBREAK20. First off, the new performance package 4.0 includes the new Lawnmower 4.0. Fourth-generation waterproof trimmer features a cutting-edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. Turn on the LED spotlight. When needed for a more precise shave, Performance Package 4.0 also includes the Weed Whacker. This nose and ear trimmer, or yeah, nose and ear trimmer, best one I've used, the best nose trimmer I've used, pretty much the only one I've used that actually works. You can also get the Liquid Formulations, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, the Crop Reviver Soothing Spray for below that keeps your high friction areas cool, calm, and protected after a good shave. Manscaped even throws in two free gifts for their performance package 4.0, the Manscaped Boxers, and the Shared Travel Bag. Get 20% off plus free shipping with code GATORSBREAK20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code GATORSBREAK20. All right, let's get into um, more heartbreak here. Let's get into some of the specifics of what I brought up here at the beginning of the episode. The conservative approach. The conservative approach. A couple of ways. Nothing downfield for Emory Jones. Look, 10 of 11 at halftime, 105 yards, a touchdown to the Jaquavion Frazier's. Thought he looked comfortable in the first half. Uh, finishes the game 23 of 31, only 203 yards, one touchdown, the one bad interception. No threat to pass the ball deep here from Emory Jones. Six and a half yards per attempt, only 8.8 yards per completion. His longest completion of the night, only 22 yards. 22 yards, longest completion. There are no explosives in the passing game. None. Nothing to test the defense down the field. Emory hardly looks downfield. Consistent issue here in this offense, no matter the defense being played. I mean, you, you could even not really pin the loss on him either, but 
in a game like this, you're going to need a, a player to break out, a player to make a play. Some of those plays were there here. Neat. I mean, is AR the, the, the answer here to get those more explosive plays at the quarterback position? There were some chances for deep passes, just not even attempted, not even taken. And that was the next step I was looking for for, in, in, for Emory and his progression this season. But I'm not so sure that part of the game is coming, and it's holding this offense back. Uh, and that's part of the conservative approach here. That maybe maybe not on Mullen. Now you can put Mullen. You can, I guess, throw this on Mullen if you know you don't want Emory out there. But you know there are play designs, there are play calls where there's guys open down the field and just not even being attempted to be thrown to. Um, like uh, with this run game and the way it has been working, I thought teams had to focus on that so much that the downfield passing game would open up. It hasn't. Go look at the game. The long completions for Emory Jones, 18, 22, 16, 16, 18. And that ain't going to cut it if the run game can't get going. Conservative approach there from the quarterback position. So, you know, you like to see Florida test the ball down the field. And some of it is when they have to on third down. Another example of the conservative nature of this game. Like I said, I don't mind if you want to run the ball with what we have seen this season. That's you know that's been the bread and butter. It has worked, but not on third and passing situations. But it just wasn't you know run, running running just a conservative approach overall there on third down. I mean, it wasn't just running on third third and long. First third down of the game is the third and six quarterback keeper for three yards. Florida punts on fourth and three at the Kentucky forty one. A place Mullen. Could have went for it, but he punts. A place Mullen usually goes for it, but punts. I kind of expected him to go for it. Uh, third and six, you know, I'd okay with the quarterback run there if you're going to go for it on fourth down, but he didn't. Conservative. Later in the game, third and 13, set up by a false start penalty on third and eight. Pass goes for six yards, not even testing the sticks. Nothing, I mean, conservative approach there. Third and 11 at the own seven, Malik Davis runs for a loss of four. That one I understand a bit. Offensive line has just gotten back-to-back procedure penalties, obviously lost at that moment. Play it safe, get back on the sideline, go figure it out. Well, you didn't. You never figured it out. Then a third and 10, Emory scramble for six. Third and 13, Emory scramble, scramble for three. Couldn't hit third and long, partly due to the approach. Lack of throws. You had a chance to get aggressive. You didn't, partly because of play calls, running the ball third and long, partly because quarterback won't test it. Also, now, more conservative point in the game that rubbed this all pretty much the wrong way, the drive before halftime. That was inexcusable, I think. I know what Mullen says. Um, wanted to get into wanted to get into halftime. Wanted to settle the team down. One fifty six left before halftime. The Gators starting on its own thirteen yard line. Florida had all three timeouts. All three. You have to run your two minute offense. Plenty of time. At least attempt to get in the field goal range. Extend that ten to seven lead that you had going into halftime. Mullen's usually aggressive in this situation. Start off. Emory Jones completes a pass to Justin Shorter for two yards. Clock runs. Jones completes a pass to Troy Whittemore for 14 yards in the first down, 29-yard line. Okay, get it going. It's, t- it's time to get it going. You got your first down. All of a sudden, calls it off. No aggression. Conservative approach. Malik, Derry, Malik Davis carries the ball twice for 10 yards. Mullen lets the clock run out for the first half while taking all three of the timeouts into the locker room. Mullen was asked why he chose to go conservative right before halftime rather than pressing the issue and being aggressive. Quote, you're on the road. You're back to the wall. We're making some errors right there. You get out, you know, in order to kind of, you're looking at the clock. You got about 30 seconds, I think it was. We got the ball in our 30-yard line on the road. You're like, you know, like I said, and look, this is just kind of verbatim here. I know it sounds clunky, but this is kind of how he was talking about it. Because I thought we were playing, we were doing some good things. Let's just kind of go settle everybody down and not create a potential issue right there. All right, I can believe that more if you don't open up the drive of two passes. Like I know they weren't deep passes, and we've already talked about that. 
But if you were afraid of Emory Jones making a mistake, then why open the drive with two passes? And I know that's the big thought here of not trusting Emory Jones, and that part of it, it probably true, is, is, is part of it. But Emory had been playing pretty well up to that point. I know the interception came later, and people will fall back on that and say, well, yep, see, that's what he didn't want to happen. And I'm sorry, you don't coach scared. Not with a fourth-year quarterback. And if that's the case, then that's on you for not lack of development, and that's on him for lack of development as well. But Emory been playing well up to that point and safe up to that point. He just completed a pass to Whittemore to set up a first down. Now, look, I can see if the offensive line struggles also played a part in this decision. I actually agree with that part of it. But if you're going to open up the drive with two passes and then all of a sudden oh, flip the switch and say, oh, never mind, I'm not going to trust the offense to keep going. you got three timeouts. Mullen usually aggressive in that moment. Now, I, I think he went into the shell with the worries of, uh, of the offensive line. I don't know why. I don't know why you open up the drive with two, two passes and then all of a sudden call it off. Uh, I think the offensive line probably played more into the part of not trusting Emory, but I do think it was a combination of both. Uh, but just another miscalculation on Mullen's part, in my opinion. Would have loved to have been more aggressive in, that, in, in the close game situation. I know a lot of people will point out Emory's interception later on in the game. And the block field goal, come on, you're not predicting block field goals. You at least try to go get in field goal range. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not saying you know, go press the issue of get, throw the ball 30, 40 yards down the field. I mean, I'd love to see that in that situation, of course, but you at least got to try and get on the field goal range, especially after you get that first down. And that's just that that's poor management right there to me. In a close game, in a situation you're usually aggressive in. Now you weren't getting the two for one, but you were you knew Kentucky was getting the ball after halftime. You had time to go do something. And you can you could have been still a little conservative if you just wanted to try and play for the field goal. But there was no aggression there at all whatsoever. Mm. I, that, one, that one rubs us all. <laughs> Not all. I, just, I had some people defending it, of course. But that's the one that's going to sit rough for a while uh, with, with, this, with this fan base. All right. Let's keep moving forward. Man, I hate to have to feel this way, but here we go. Let's go back and look at how much the third down penalties hurt. Florida was 4 of 13 on third down. 3 of 5 on third and short, and that's 1 to 4 yards. Florida was 3 of 5 on third and short. Problem is, you were killing yourself and taking, your out, taking yourself out of third and short. Florida was 0 for 5 on third and long. That's 9 plus yards. So how big were those third down penalties? <laughs> there were seven altogether. Six of those were false starts. You killed yourself on third down. The ones of note. Remember, Florida, third and five, or three of five on third and short. Not bad. You wouldn't, If you could keep yourself in third and short all game, you would have lived with it. And if three of five is any indication, you were having some success there. So I'm going to go through some third downs here. Florida had a third and one, then a false start. Then a third and six, another false start. Failed conversion on third and 11. That's where Davis was tackled for that loss of four deep in Florida territory. That was the end toward the end of the first quarter. Later, Florida had a third and three at the Kentucky 37. False start. Failed to convert third and eight. Ended up punting in Kentucky territory. All because of a false start. Couldn't overcome it. Then... After the Trevez, uh, Trevez interception, Florida's in good field position at the Kentucky 24. Damian Pierce with a 10-yard run. Richard Garage call for holding. Back up Florida 10 yards to the Kentucky 34. You only gain three yards on the Emory scramble. Field goal gets blocked on the next play. You had a 10-yard run. Okay, maybe it doesn't happen if the holding call's not there, but, but I mean, Pierce, I think – he. Most of the time, he, he, he was getting yards either, either way on the play. But the holding call kills it, takes it back, field goals even further, gets blocked. You know, to, Damian Pierce gets some more yards there. You're set, up, uh, you're set up to keep the drive going just a bit. Kill yourself. A chain reaction there from a – oh, man, from um, that Pierce run – now, that, that's, the, I mean, that's the one that hurt. You, know, you're, you have third down. You get a good play. Richard Garage call for a hold. 
backs up Florida 10 yards to the 34. Emory scrambles. Field goal gets blocked the next play. Late in the game, on the last drive, Garage gets called for a fall start at the five-yard line, backing up Florida on the last drive of the game on third down. This was third and five. You know, highlights the flags on third down. Three instances right there where Florida is in Kentucky territory and turned third and short, third and manageable into third and long, couldn't convert all game in third and long. Third and five, you know, three and five on third and short. Would have loved to see what would have happened if Florida doesn't shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, but Florida not playing composed in those situations. One helped lead to a blocked field goal. Then had a waste of timeout on the last drive of the game because of the penalty and the 10-yard runoff. And the lack of focus right there, doom, dooming the Gators. I mean, that's inexcusable. Lack of preparation. Lack of not being ready on the road. I mean, this is this is not this stats first road game together. You you knew what to expect. And I mean, I don't know what you practiced all week in, in, in practice and not having this offensive line ready. Maybe maybe the clap didn't the, 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 the clapping by the quarterback didn't come up in practice all week, but you got to be able to adjust somewhat in the game. And and, and it, it barely happened. So another big part. Another big takeaway, and we've talked about lack of aggression, being conservative somewhat. The last drive of the, 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 the last drive of the game. For the first and goal at the Kentucky nine yard line. Here we go. Here's the list of plays. Throw in the flat to gamble, negative one. A run by Jones for five yards. False start, take it back five yards. Throw away, you get the face mask for, for Kentucky. There you go. Start over. And the wide receiver screen to Copeland. Play was there. He has to, you know, try to make a catch. Slips. That was a touchdown there. If if, if no slip, right. lose four yards. Another false start. Design quarterback run from the fourteen yard line. He only gained three yards. Throw him through the flat to Davis. Three yards. Now the last play of the game. Throw to Whittemore. Incomplete. Only one that was the shot in the end zone was the final play. And Will Miles in his article pointed out in, in his review article today, take the quote from him here. In fact, Florida was in the red zone twice in the final two drives, only took two shots at the end zone total. That's <laughs> lack, lack of trust in the offense. Emory Jones, maybe a lack of trust in what he's seeing. There are some chances there to throw the ball in the end zone. I mean, Stinks with the whole Copeland screen. It was there. Slip and fall. Maybe a better throw. Maybe he doesn't slip and fall. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of ways to look at the, the, the late game, end game situation. Unacceptable. I mean, it's just the the little, I mean, it's the little things that I mean, I go back to those third, the penalties on third down. You can't put yourself in, in a close game situation. You can't put yourself in that situation over and over again. I mean, that was ugly. You can't, you cannot have that happen. But it happened. And we have to look at the reasons why. And most of it's lack of preparation. Un, uninspired football, I, I, I think, up front. You know, Kentucky did some good things. I'll give them credit uh, for – holding Emory Jones in check, not letting him get crazy with his legs. I think that uh, definitely affected Emory Jones and how composed he was. We know he's better when he can run the ball. It opens up a little bit uh, in the passing game for him as well. Didn't didn't happen. Uh, credit to Kentucky there for pretty much controlling this Gator offensive line and also limiting Emory Jones and his ability to run the ball. Look, I, know, I feel like I'm all over the place here, but man, <laughs> it's just kind of uh, where I'm going. You know, my head's everywhere with this one. Um, but lack of focus, lack of aggression. I mean, that's, that's where we can keep going on this. The lack of what, one more, like just big picture wise, the games like that, that's just happened. I mean, performance, performance like this, it, it raises the question about the direction of this program under Dan Mullen in his fourth season. Why the inexcusable losses? This isn't an inexcusable loss the way it played out. 
Now, I thought it would be a close game. You know, I thought Florida would pull away to win by two scores in the fourth quarter. And I didn't see the game playing that like I didn't see the Gators not being prepared to play a game like this. This was an inexcusable loss the way it played out. Now, don't get me wrong. I've, you know, I've said this before uh, earlier in the episode. Kentucky, Kentucky's built their program to a nice level. But you, with the first couple of seasons, should have been able to take advantage of FSU and Miami being down, being able to take advantage of even better recruiting that just didn't happen. You should have been able to build the gap between you and Kentucky, where even a poor performance leaves you leave Kentucky with a win. Didn't happen. Inexcusable loss. Just the, the way it played out. And here we go. I know you guys have seen the stats out there. Florida, three and five in the last eight games. The only wins being FAU, USF, and Tennessee. Look, I know two of those losses are to Alabama. No shame there. The, but the other three, LSU, Oklahoma in 2020, this year Kentucky, all have their inexcusable descriptions in various ways. But where's attention, the attention to detail? That's where a lot of this comes from. That's where a lot of this comes from. It's the small things that separate teams in games like this. Where, where, where are the small things? Where are the, where are the small things that make this team different? And that, that's lacking. That is, is lacking. A lot of the, the attention to detail – the sense of urgency, those are, the, those are the big things. Play down the competition, play up for the big games. Uh, that's just been the, that's been the MO uh, for, for, for Dan Mullen so far, and that's, that's not going to get it done. Something has to change in that regard. I'm not calling for Dan Mullen to be fired. I just, no, I, I'm not. But you, there have to be, have to be some changes. Have to be probably some personal changes going into this season. That's what's going to appease a lot of the fan base. And I look, a lot of us, we kind of know in a way this season's pretty much already over as far as going competing for the SEC championship and all that. You can throw you can throw that away. We can forget about that right now. So personnel changes leading to some better play. But once the season's over, there's going to have to be a program overhaul. You should not be in year four and have the questions we're having about Dan Mullen in the direction of this program. And part of it stems from sense of urgency. I mean, this this stems back from 2020 a bit. You had a team. You had a team to go about uh, things the right way. Defense falls apart all year long. No sense of urgency to look like to try and get better. Things didn't change on that side of the ball. Still still had your chances, you beat Georgia, and then after that, you just look kind of satisfied throughout the rest of the year. Some lackadaisical performances that you were just getting by with the rest of the, the rest of the season, came to a head versus LSU, like I said, rallied somehow and rose up to the occasion versus Alabama. You still lost, but that's the type of performance you need to go, that you needed throughout the whole season. You can't just pick and chew. You can't just flip a switch all the time. It's not going to happen. And then the inexcusable, whatever you want to call the Oklahoma game, just not taking it serious, um, using it as uh, just just trying to get the season over with. And then, you know, this season, all right, where's the step on your throat mentality? We always kind of fall back on, you know, the first couple games of the season. And there is some truth to it. Don't get me wrong, but we, we fall back on the – Willie's tinkering. He's working on things. There's a lot of young guys getting playing time and all that. But you know, where's the where's the going and taking care of business? Yes, you won the games versus FAU and USF, but you wanted to see you know that you you wanted to see Florida come out and dominate. No, that didn't happen. And then, okay, you play Bama tough. There, you um, feeling better uh, about the team. Once again, rising to the occasion. Then Tennessee last week, okay, coming to 14 points. We saw some growth on defense, still some questions there. Maybe going into Kentucky game from the Tennessee game, defense showed up. That can go by the wayside right now. But then the offense, you know, the, the questions. 
the questions that uh, on offense, leaving from the Tennessee game, looking for the Kentucky game. We didn't see the progression. There's no progression on the offensive side of the ball. What you had been doing well did not carry over in the run game. And you got what you got last night. Lack of atten- like lack of focus, lack of attention. And just Gator Nation, a lot of Gator Nation out there. I'm hearing about it. And then everybody says, oh, dude, Twitter's not real life. Okay, that, that's fine. I'm getting texts from people I know, too, who not on Twitter uh, out there. Not really on social media much at all either. Do, do not like the direction this program's going. Should this be the case in year four, the way this team looks? I don't think so. When you're in year four and you got your quarterback, your recruits, and where's the arrow point? I think it's a valid question. And um, I won't blame you if you feel it's going down. I won't feel you if it's you feel like it's straight line. And in some ways, I guess I won't blame you if you feel like it's going up, but there's not a lot of evidence there. So I think questions are valid. Questions are valid right now. And in year four, I don't think uh, we were, I don't think we were wondering if you go back to the time Mullen was hired in 2018, did you think you'd be two and two versus Kentucky? Did you think, um, the games versus Georgia and LSU and Kentucky, right, right, putting them all together, that uh, you have a losing record right now. I mean, we all thought, okay, Dan Mullen gets Florida talent and he raises his bar a little bit. In some ways, that's true. But when the talent level's equal or greater, still not coming out on the winning end. I think that can be part of the direction of the program and where you feel at it. And now looking at Kentucky, I mean, if you want to go by recruiting rankings and where the, where the talents at and compare the talent, well, now you're losing to teams that don't have the talent that you have. And look, we've always said recruiting is not everything. It, it puts you in position. Development goes a long way as well, but okay, let's go develop some four and five stars. Uh, but you know, right now you're looking at year four. And I don't think we should be asking ourselves this question. Where, where is the direction uh, of this program? I, don't even, I mean, and some of the status of where this team is at, I don't think should be there in year four. We really should be Dan Mullen's hand-picked quarterback still figuring about after five games into the season if he's ready to go and ready to lead the team. I, I don't think we should be asking that question, but we are. Defense overall? I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll give him credit for this performance and, and you know, pat him on the back. They did what they were supposed to. Okay, but big picture. Are they where they're supposed to be in year four with the players and the and the, the recruiting that you've you've done the last four years to get them in your system? Yeah, doesn't look promising either, really. So I don't know. You know. A lot of people will probably call this overreaction. Okay, go go right ahead. I mean, they agree with you in some way, some fashion, but you know, Florida, Florida should be winning these games. You shouldn't be losing to Kentucky in year four under Dan Mullen. So, I mean, all, all these questions will be we'll, – we'll, you play Vanderbilt next week. This is going to linger. You know, d- nobody's going to take solace out of next week. I mean, you can't go out there and lose a game, of course. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at the game like we always do. But with who you're playing and uh, coming off of this, I mean, this is going to th- – this one's going to linger. All these questions are going to linger. And this one stings. This one stings. No, no other ways to put it. Uh, there and so man I mean I don't even I just didn't think we'd see this type of performance not being ready to go in year four of Dan Mullen that that's just I think where that's just where it goes for me three and five last eight games only wins over FAU USF and Tennessee yeah, Go, going back to when I saw, you know, going back to, okay, when Dan Mullins hired in 2018, did you ever think there would be a point where you would look at any eight-game stretch and say, Dan Mullins going to Dan Mullins gonna be three and five? 
Nope. <laughs> I sure didn't. I mean, look, I, I was for the hire. He was my number one guy when we were looking for a head coach. But now, I mean, there's a, there's a look in the mirror that has to happen. I still think he can be the right guy. I, I really do. But he's got to look in the mirror and make some changes. Right? First of all, starting with him and this conservative, conservative approach and, and taking opponents lightly, that, that's one part. And then, the, and then the, the rest of it of who you have on staff and who – first of all, how can they, how can they help in, in coaching? I mean, I know he trusts these guys in coaching. I, he really does. The Greg Knox, the Billy Gonzalez, and the John Hevesys of the world, he does. But maybe, it's a getting, maybe it's getting a little stale. And it certainly is not the best on the recruiting front. So I think, you know, and I, and I, and I already – Five games in, hate looking toward the end of the season. But these are, I think, questions that come up when you have a performance like this. And is the program in, headed in the right direction? Because I don't think you should have these type of performances, these type of losses, these type of games. I know bad games happen. That's, that's part of football. But when you tie this all together with three and five in the last eight games, that, that's where it's coming from. This is, it's, it's not really new. You go back to the end of last year, how last year ended, and how you felt. And the end of the season, just, yeah, you knew Florida had a good team, but wasn't playing as good as they should have been playing. I mean, base, I'll go to it one more time. I know Kentucky's better. They are. And when people say the comparison, you know, Jim McElwain and Will Muschamp didn't lose to Kentucky. I get that. They would have to these Kentucky teams. But you also should have been growing the last couple of years. And Florida does not lose to Kentucky. Just, just don't. But they are. That's the truth of it. Kentucky showed up ready to play. And don't get me wrong, their, their performance wasn't great either. That's part of the reason why this, this, there's this frustration here. Kentucky didn't play a great game. They made the plays when they needed to. They made the big plays. They had their screen. They had their home run play that made a difference they had their special teams play that made a difference you know so they made the plays yeah, they're five and oh right now i mean so i mean i i, I don't want to make it sound like you know in kentucky fans i'm not really you know if, if, if you're going to come in and listen because i know a lot of opponent fans do and with these review episodes and ha ha told you so blah 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 but you know that's just the, the reality of it. this is more from our angle, our perspective, more about Florida and what they did wrong. Does Kentucky get some credit too? Absolutely, but neither team. I mean, neither team played the great game there, but Kentucky did make the plays. Kentucky made the plays to win the game. But I just don't think Florida should have been in that situation. And maybe that's where we're wrong. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's the rough reality of it. I mean, if people want to say results speak for themselves, then go right ahead. I can't argue against it. I can't argue with you there. Right now, Kentucky's better than Florida, and that's the harsh reality of it. Maybe that's an overreaction, but right now, day after a game, I don't think so. I don't feel like it. Ooh, man, I don't know. I know I'm supposed to know, but <laughs> that's, that's just where you can tell the frustration. That's where the fan, the fan in me comes out a little bit. Um, but no, I just didn't think we'd be here in year four asking these questions. And maybe that's part. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe that that that's the that's the issue there. All right. Well, there we go. That's kind of the look at the game. A little more specifics where I think there was the, there were the differences in the game of the third down penalties, the lack of execution, the lack of aggression. Lack of Focus on little details. Little things add up. And that, that that's probably the biggest mark of this team, this program. Those little things that keep adding up. All right, here we go. Let's take a look around the SEC. This is what makes it even worse. I said, uh, I was talking to everybody in the Discord chat. Um, yesterday, and I was like, well, with the performances you got yesterday in the SEC, Florida just needs to go out and dominate Kentucky if you don't want to hear about Georgia and Alabama 
the rest of the year. That's exactly the opposite is what happened. Georgia, Alabama put together some dominating performances yesterday in their big games. Here's the scoreboard if you're watching here on YouTube. Go through it right here. Georgia beats Arkansas 37 to nothing. Complete domination by Georgia. Putting themselves squarely in the driver's seat of the SEC East. Then Florida's opponent last week, Tennessee, held them to 14 points. They go and run rough shot over Missouri, win 62 to 24, running up and down the field on that Missouri team. Big game of the week. Another one, Alabama Ole Miss. Alabama dominates Ole Miss 42 to 21. Game wasn't even really that close. When you go back and look at it, team Florida played in the swamp a couple weeks ago. Alabama lose by two. But there we go. That's what you can't do. You can't put it together consistently. Alabama looking like a team that's going to continue rolling on the rest of the year. Alabama and Georgia separate themselves, not only in the SEC, but in the country as well. Um, and look, that's part of going back to the issue in year four. It should, should, should. We'll see what happens in Jacksonville, of course. We do. But should you fill the gap is that far in year four? No, you shouldn't. You should not. South Carolina 23 to 14 over Troy. Mississippi State gets a late score. Comes back and beats Texas A&M 26 22. Vanderbilt last get field goal win for them over UConn. That's Florida's next opponent. Vanderbilt Commodores, they needed a last-second field goal to beat UConn 30-28 to at home. And then, I mean, this one this one kind of rubbed some salt in the wound for me a little bit. Brian Harson in Auburn, first-year head coach at Auburn. Yes, I know, not a first-year head coach, but coach at Boise State. But they go on the road and beat LSU 24-19. Auburn, team that could beat, barely beat Georgia State. Uh, but they've had, you know, they went on the road. They didn't fold under pressure against Penn State a couple weeks ago. Played a pretty good game on the road. It didn't look like they were lost under a first-year head coach in Happy Valley. They lose that game to Penn State, but they're in the game at the end. And then another big road trip to LSU, and they come out with the victory 24-19. to So, you know, I hate doing the comparison thing sometimes, but Brian Harson, first-year head coach at Auburn, takes his team on the road twice this year and looks nowhere near as lost as a Dan Mullen team at Kentucky. I mean, I think you I think the comparison is valid there. I think you start looking at things like that. Maybe you can say I'm stretching it too far. Maybe I am. But I think you can I think you can bring it up. I absolutely think you can. So there's a look at your week in the SEC where Georgia, Alabama dominate. Pull, they're gonna you know set the course for the SEC championship already. I mean, you put together Forest performance a couple weeks ago versus Alabama. You were looking forward to that game in Jacksonville, and you still can. It's still college football. You still go take your chances and and, and play the game. But with two losses, Florida already has. It's gonna take a miracle to even have a chance at Atlanta right now. So there you go. All right, I know I was all over the place with this one. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> usually more put together than this, but that was, look, I was um, said up late, putting notes, trying to put this one together, looking at things, looking at things I wanted to look at, you know, just awful third down plays with the, the penalties and going back and looking at it. I mean, this one's uh, this one hurts. You know, you don't, uh, I don't know. You don't, you don't, you don't look at this one in many positive ways. All right, that'll do it for this episode here of Gators Breakdown after whew, upsetting performance there by the Gators. I know we all expected more, expected better, but um, I don't know. They always always talk about that Gator standard, and this is not it. That performance versus Kentucky is not it. All right, that'll do it. I'll be back with Will Miles on Gators Breakdown Monday. Monday night. We'll get into more of this as well. Get Will's thoughts. You can go read his article there at Reading Reaction. Um, and see where see where Florida goes from here. I think that's something um we can we can discuss. 
eventually we need to move on. You do have a game against Vanderbilt this week. Uh, but as I said, with that being your next opponent, I mean, it, it, it gives a chance to get things right. But there's not going to be a whole lot of solace in that. So these questions will linger because of that. <laughs> so, and the next big game is at LSU on the road. And then a lot of people want to compare what we saw versus Kentucky to what we're going to see a couple weeks in LSU, knowing that you have to clean up the issues in what we saw. So there we go. All right, guys on YouTube, I see um, see um, see all the comments, all the live comments there. Thank you much. Thanks for hopping in here and a little bit of uh, therapy session here. <laughs> Um, and, and, and going through this, but uh, thanks for hopping on. Thanks for hopping on live because I'm not um, not sure when we go live on Sundays. I try and put it all together uh, there, but I know it's not a set time every Sunday. It's usually around twelve, one o'clock. So thank you guys um, for, for hopping in here live every week. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out here on Gators Breakdown. That'll do it. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.